Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Pure Prison. This is Shy, and we have a very special guest in the studio today. We are with Keith Johnson. Now, I reached out to Keith because I met him on uh, Soul Sisters mm -hmm. Unlocking Cell Doors. He's an amazing man and has an amazing testimony to share with you. So hold on to your seats, guys, because here he comes. All right. Hi, Keith. Can you introduce yourself for us, please? Yes, my name is Roderick Keith Johnson, and I go by Keith. And um, that's it. And basically, I've been an advocate on behalf of LGBTQ prisoners, uh, criminal justice reform, uh, do a lot of work around mental health, substance abuse, as well as human trafficking and sexual assault. Wow. That is a huge undertaking right now. I mean, that's huge. Now, can you tell us um, a little bit about your journey, please? Because it's so important. Wow. Um, basically, um, my journey is one of a lot of lived experiences around uh, incarceration, substance abuse, mm. mental health issues, um, homelessness. But all of these were things that were my fault because of the way that society was basically built around us all. Especially people of color. But mm. I came from a middle class family. Um, very country town. We had a, I was raised on a ranch. Um, went to the military at 17 and graduated from college at 24. Wow, and, right. Yep. And um, after that is when I started experiencing these problems in life. Mm -hmm. And at the time, this was 1994, 95. And there was no such thing as alternative to incarceration at that okay. time. Because it was either probation or prison. Right. And you decide which one you want. And um, we always going to take probation because we don't want to go to jail. Oh, and, right. uh, but that has always been the biggest trap for the minority community. Because all it does is basically drag you down the road until they're ready to take you, pretty much. Mm. I entered prison as a nonviolent LGBTQ prison in year 2000. And immediately upon entering prison, I was approached by prison gangs. The way the Texas prison gang, the way the Texas prison system was structured then was one of prison gangs. You know, you got white gangs, black gangs, Hispanic gangs, and nobody interact with each other. Mm. But if you were an LGBTQ prisoner at that time, you basically had to have a man was their point of view. I was approached and I basically um, said that I ain't getting no man. You know, I came down here this time and I'm going home. Right. But the following day I was beaten to a pulp by the gangster disciples. And after that I was forced to be with one of the gang members that basically was, per, you know, my overseer. And um, that started 18 months of pure hell for me. I can't because I was, bought, I was bought and sold into sexual slavery. Basically, it was human trafficking behind all. I went to prison officials nine separate times. Each time it was all white classification committees. Because all most of Texas' prisons are in rural areas where oh. black people don't live. So mostly these white committees felt that me being a black homosexual after nine separate times that I could take care of myself. There's oh. nothing that said Black homosexuals can't survive in general population. Oh, well, I can't understand why 
all of these crips and bloods are on this building and they are let you be sold to Mexicans and white gangs. Well, number one, crips and bloods are not my protector. That's your job. <laughs> Safety and security, right? Exactly. <laughs> and uh, these are wardens saying these things. Mm -hmm. okay. And then they say, well, why don't you just go down there and fuck or fight? Why don't you go down there and get you a man? Nine separate times. These are things that I had to endure over an 18 month period. After about the first year of this, I became hopeless. I was depressed. Um, that was the hardest time. I mean, it was you're being bought and sold. You having sex in showers, stairwell, recreation, y'all, mm -hmm. wherever it's called. Mm -hmm. And uh, Thank so you finally, so finally, I wrote my family and asked them to help me get uh, moved into safety. Every Not time my family would call, they would tell my family, "Oh, he's doing good. We moved him to a new place today." But all they would do is move you to another cell oh, on the other you. side of the plane. Other you. side of the plane. And that didn't work. Right. And my family have never had a prison experience or any type of um they don't understand the things that we go through. Right. You know, they don't. And they, they were never raised, you know, that's just what the nature of our family was. So they were hoping, they didn't know what to do. Keep asking the people to help you. Right. Um, one of my mother's cousins in Houston um, intervened on my behalf. And okay. she did get me put, get me moved to another building, but it didn't make a difference. And it kept going and kept going. So finally, um, I wrote friends. You know, I wrote organizations. Mm -hmm. You know, I did everything I could do. I don't care if I read this magazine and seen an address in there that said it was some kind of hope. I wrote them. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I wrote a friend of mine in Oklahoma that I went to college with that had basically um, became like a paralegal attorney, you know, like an attorney. Yeah. And I was like, well, maybe he can help, you know? And um, he was like, after I told him that story, he was devastated. And he gave me a letter that he had found on his desk out of clear blue the day I wrote it. And it was to the ACLU's National Prison Project in Washington, D.C. And I wrote that, you know, and I was like, told him my story. And the ACLU National Prison Project does not answer individual prison letters unless it's involving a class action type oh, lawsuit. Okay. Mm. You know, to get an idea of what's happening. But your individual letter, they don't read, it goes to like paralegals and people like that that filter it before it gets to the attorneys. Right. The director, Margaret Winter, was leaving her office and saw this letter on the ground. And instead of going back and putting it back in the office, I mean, it was on the on the outside with the mail. Uh, and I assumed someone had dropped the letter. She went to the elevator and she opened the letter. And she was devastated. And the next day, she called. Wow. And, uh, huh. and the next day, she called. And she was like, I got this letter yesterday, and we're real disturbed about it. It sounds like, too, it, it just sounds impossible. You know, <laughs> it sounds unbelievable. You know, this don't sound like something like this could happen to something. 
because the public they don't they don't really even people like you're saying that are involved they don't understand what truly happens there because the impossible becomes reality and she had but the thing about it that's what they do is they file class action lawsuits against like the mississippi department of corrections you know for solitary fine yes. you know they yes. know that the, the impossible conditions but they couldn't believe something like this could happen. They just didn't believe that a person would be raped and sold like that. They didn't. They they just never heard of anything like that. And they've been they've been attorneys for years and years, listening to prisoner cases. And she made it understood that they didn't do individual cases. Correct. Because they only do class action on behalf. To, to have systemic change. And she said that you're telling me that all this happened. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, Mr. Johnson, me and a couple of my attorneys, we're coming down there and we're going to talk. Hope. And they <laughs> came. And when they came and they talked to me, they said, this is just sounding impossible do you have any proof or anything that tells that or you you know where's your proof at i right. said i don't really have no proof except what i'm telling you but i filed like 500 grievances and i've already and then i wrote my family and my family know about it and she said wait a minute you filed grievances against this i said yes ma'am i filed mm -hmm. step one step two but they didn't do nothing so Instead of throwing them away, I just got them sitting down there and pack them from place to place. Mm. She got up and she said, can you go escort him back to that park? She said, Mr. Johnson, bring me everything that you got documented. And can I hold you Pardon? up for a second really quick? Because the, the, the grievance is a process that has to be adhered to when you are doing something in prison. And it is a step process. Don't think it goes straight to attention because it doesn't um and and you are fortunate to have had them return because there's many times when those grievances do not but they do nothing right in the on the they do nothing right i mean the only time that a grievance is worth anything is when you file in the lawsuit that's the only time it's worth anything <laughs> because you don't get any rectification from At all. right very and sure. that's just the way it is. And when I took her that, she went back to Washington, D.C. And called me the next day. And she said, Mr. Johnson, this is totally impossible. But we, this is something that we're going to take as an individual case. And we've never done that. Amazing. And she said, your case is the magnitude of this case the reason we're taking it as an individual is because we feel this case is going to change the country this case is going to have a magnitude that will change the prison systems yes and i'm like i don't care what you do you know <laughs> I just you can go me. you can change the prison system just get me moved, you know. I can change it for me right now. I know. Yeah. Okay. You can do whatever y'all want to do with them papers I gave. Right. Just get me moved to another building. And um, <laughs> she said that. Uh, so then, the few days later, they went to the federal courts and got a temporary injunction against the state of Texas. Yes. And. A week later, I was moved to one of the safest facilities within the prison system. And TD State and um, the ACLU filed one of the largest lawsuits that I've ever seen in the country against the state of Texas. Wow. Due to sexual, sexual discrimination mm -hmm. and racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. And all, every, and every other civil rights you know, magnitude. Violation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, when they took that case and filed it, 
the media got a hold of that case. And when the media got a hold of that case, it set off a firestorm across the world. Yes, I read it. In, oh, my gosh. Incredible. Everybody responded to this case. And I was like, wow. And people turned out. They started uh, calling legislators. They were, uh, man, it was crazy. I mean, they were in front of prisons like, I want my son out of there right now. Right. Period. I'm not hearing nothing else y'all talking about. I want my son out of that prison right now. Uh, I don't care if it's happening to him or it's not. I want him out of there because I read what happened to this man. And this they is would what we stop. need. This is what society needs to come together and understand that there needs to be compassion because things like bad things happen. And bad mm -hmm. things happen when crime is involved also. But that does not mean that a person can't change. Compassion is needed so much. We need to change the way we think. And we have no compassion because compassion stops when people are already ingrained and taught that this is what it is. That's right. And we have what they call the prison industrial complex that makes billions of dollars per year. Say Make it, I agree. And um, when this happened, um, my parents were flown to Washington, D.C., I think like a week later. Wow. Congress summoned them and they wanted to hear this story because these men read this in the newspaper. It was in every newspaper in the country. And they'd ride into the office reading this story. And they're like, you cannot tell me that this happened in right. the United States of America. And it's a problem. They asked my family, what the hell happened? And it, it's still happening. There's, it, mm -hmm. What is the problem with this? There's a problem that needs to be addressed. He didn't know that. Um, first time offenders should not go directly to prison. That it's should not not and I'm not talking about anything capital crimes. I, I'm talking about can you do substance abuse? Will that help them? Let's find out what's happening. Are they what's going on in their lives that this happened? There's so many other opportunities. There's all types of there's all types of Things that, that people don't just steal to pay the rent. Right. Right. There's got to be something you going on. And, and because society, there's something going on. Right. And society as a whole has to take this into, in I just don't understand why, why we can't understand that you have to look at the background a little bit more. Okay. We have to rehabilitate also. And without mm -hmm. rehabilitation, what are we letting back into our neighborhoods? Our society, Keith, your society, my society, we live here. We are members of it now. We have to be the change. Right. Say it and again. We have to be the change. And for 19 years, I've been doing this. Yes. And I mean, we've done, I've been, I've testified before Congress. They passed the National Prison Rape Elimination Act in my name. Yes. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals made a landmark ruling the first of its kind that said prison officials will be sued for any form of sexual or racial discrimination. So they're on notice. So the what, what are you, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. What is your big thing going on and what are the well, changes you're working on right now? When I saw people turn out like they did, that became a revolution. And I stood up and I came back into the into the fight. And I started as a fundraiser for the Black Lives Matter group. Okay. Two weeks later, I find out that the Black Lives Matter movement does not provide funding. The local grassroots groups, nor is there a coordinated strategy that each organizer thought there's no coordinated strategy. And I approached them about it. what the hell? Because change 
You ask people in the streets that are marching, you say, well, what do you want to change? Well, we just want people to stop beating up black. We want the police to stop beating up black people. Right, right. Okay. That's not change. Change is better housing. Change is better mental health care. Yeah. Change is substance abuse. Rehabilitation Change is criminal program. justice reform. Yeah. Change is homeless youth. These are the things that are changed. Change ain't about beating no black people. If you don't stop this, it's going to keep happening. So the solution to that was to unify groups across the country. Yeah. And I found some of the brightest minds, the most dedicated and committed people. There is nobody within this organization because I created it as a donor-led, donor-managed organization. Everybody, if you gave a dollar, you are a member of this organization. If your commitment and your dedication is to what you're doing. Because my fundraising technique was through social media. I'm old, 52 years old. We don't believe in no, we don't believe. We bake sales and car washes. Listen, I'm 50. I don't <laughs> do it no more. <laughs> we bake sales and car washes. And these people were given to me and not even seen my face. I know. Isn't that a blessing? It's such a miracle because the, but you also have to remember that when people with forward mining and progressive thinking that want true change see something like this, they see it for what it is. It is a possibility of hope for true change. So, Keith, we, we, we are about out of time here. I just want to tell you, let me bring your face way up here so everybody can see you. I'm going to put nnoca.org. Everybody, check it out. Keith, it was such a pleasure having you here today. Um, and I thank people like you all. You all are the change. Thank we you. We need each of you to join us. Oh, I really? don't care if you're a lawyer. If you're a doctor, mm -hmm. we need people that can basically tell us the solution. We're not the answer. I'm basically just creating a infrastructure of ideas. It's beautiful. Everybody got. We're not trying to. We're not trying to duplicate anything. We're trying to replicate what works. And we're going to stop the criminal justice system because we have to start at the front with alternatives, and we have to start at the back. With reentry. That's right. Because if we don't save them when they come home from going back to where they came, then we can't stop nothing from going in. Right. And all so of that needs to start, start inside too before they reenter. There's just so much changing. Keith, I'm just so happy to have met you and be a part of this. Um, well, y'all got my number, <laughs> and yes. we need you guys. And you guys step up for us. Absolutely. You guys totally reach out to him. Again, that's nnoca.org. Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you all. All right, you guys. So it has been such a pleasure. Um, I hope you stay tuned and listened. That is just an incredible testimony and totally making changes. Again, check out nnoca.org. Another thing that I've asked you guys to all go and check out is Society First. It is a very progressive and forward website. It lays out all the problems that are inside right now, but it also gives solutions. I really urge everyone to check it out and also go and join um, Mr. Keith and his cause. I know I am. You guys, it's been such a pleasure. Remember, Two choices, peace or pain. Every single day, every single choice is going to bring you one or the other. It's your decision. I'll see you soon. Bye, guys. Which is a 501c3. Because change, you ask people in the streets that are marching, you say, well, what do you want to change? Well, we just want people to stop beating up black. We want the police to stop beating up black people. <laughs> right, right. Okay. That's not change. Change is better housing. Change is better mental health care. Yeah. Change is substance abuse. Rehabilitation Change is criminal program. justice reform. Yeah. Change is homeless youth. These are the things that are changed. 
change ain't about to be no black people. If you don't stop this, it's going to keep happening. So the solution to that was to unify groups across the country. Yeah. And I found some of the brightest minds, the most dedicated and committed people. There is nobody within this organization because I created it as a donor-led, donor-managed organization. Everybody, if you gave a dollar, you're a member of this organization. If your commitment and your dedication is to what you're doing. Because my fundraising technique was through social media. I'm all 52 years old. We don't believe in no, we don't believe, we make sales and car washes. Listen, I'm 50, I know we can't do it no more. <laughs> we make sales and car washes. And these people were given to me and not even seen my face. I know, isn't that a blessing? It's such a miracle because the, but you also have to remember that when people with forward minding and progressive thinking that want true change see something, like this they see it for what it is it is a possibility of hope for true change so keep we, we, we are about out of time here i just want to tell you let me bring your face way up here so everybody can see you i'm gonna put n n o c a dot org everybody check it out Keith, it was such a pleasure having you here today um, and i think people like you all you all are the change Thank we you. need each of you to join us. Oh, I don't care if you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor. Mm -hmm. We need people that can basically tell us a solution. We're not the answer. I'm basically just creating a infrastructure of ideas. It's beautiful. Everybody got. We're not trying to. We're not trying to duplicate anything. We're trying to replicate what works. And we're going to stop the criminal justice system because we have to start at the front with alternatives and we have to start at the back with reentry. That's right. Because if we don't save them when they come home from going back to where they came, then we can't stop nothing from going in. Right. And all so of that needs to start, to start inside to be, before they reenter. There's just so much changing. Keith, I'm just so happy to have met you and be a part of this. Um, well, y'all got my number, <laughs> and yes. we need you guys, and you guys step up for us. Absolutely. You guys totally reached out to him. Again, that's nnoca.org. Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you all. All right, you guys. So it has been such a pleasure. Um, I hope you stay tuned and listen. That is just an incredible testimony and totally making changes. Again, check out nnoca.org. Another thing that I've asked you guys to all go and check out is Society First. It is a very progressive and forward website. It lays out all the problems that are inside right now, but it also gives solutions. I really urge everyone to check it out and also go and join uh, Mr. Keith and his cause. I know I am. You guys, it's been such a pleasure. Remember, two choices, peace or pain. Every single day, every single choice is gonna bring you one or the other. It's your decision. I'll see you soon. Bye, guys. <laughs>